dun, 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 giant massive hair. And we are getting rolling here. Just a moment, everybody, as the room gets started. Hello, Claude. How are you doing? Well, I hope. And I... Hmm? So anyways, here we go with this show. Get ready to rock and roll. Um, ba, 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 join. Anyways, here we go with this show. Get ready to rock and roll. <laughs> there we go. So hey, Claude. You have, uh, can you do me a favor and turn off the YouTube that might have playing in the background, or at least turn it down a little bit. It's awesome. <laughs> it's all good. I'm just having the last little bit of it set up right now. It'll create a little bit of feedback, but once that's dealt with, it'll be out of the way. I got to share the screen. I totally forgot to do that. And now, now we're, we're up. up. And running. and running. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. There we we go. are we live are on Future Canada Project. 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 Live, live here on the Thank Hour. Just to get, just things, to get things rolling right, rolling right off the bat. I'm just going to hit mute on, mute on your mic there for a second. There. Claude, Claude, I know, I know um, since, since Angel, Angel should be long, long Massive Gates will be a long, a long shortly, shortly, so I'm just going to make sure that that goes out. He should be any moment. It should be a very fun show. We have some epic bug nerds. Um, I'm ready, to, ready go. to go, so I'm just, so just going to pop the link over, bring it over, bring it over and get, and the, get show the show rolling. rolling. See, I'm not getting too much feedback. How does everybody hear me there on Future Canada's project? Can you hear me all right? Good. We are coming through loud and clear on both ends. So everything is happy and we are excellent there, Ashley. Claude, Dr. Anna, it's good to see you. I just saw Matt just shot Matthew Gates a message, so I'm sure he'll be along shortly. As we all know, we are here for a bug-brained evening with some amazing people. Um, we're going to have a conversation about spring IPM and how to get set up and prepare for spring when it comes to organic pest control and pest prevention. I think it's a super important subject, and we're going to try and line that up with this part of the season. Luckily, today we have two amazing guests, Claude and Matthew Claude Robert and Matthew Gates, who had just come, came up on stage. As you all know, how we regularly do this and get this started with is we just go around the room in order of everybody on screen. You've been here before, Claude, so you're going to just get, you're going to start us off. You're going to introduce yourself, and then we'll go Dr. Anibis, Ashley, and then Matthew Gates, and we'll get the conversation rolling after that. And you'll need to unmute yourself, Claude, as a heads up. Ooh, you're muted. You're muted, Claude. Bottom right hand side is the little microphone. If you click that. Oh yes. Okay. It. Thank you. you. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm excited to be uh, part again of uh, another great event uh, with all the bug nerds and uh, the people that want to learn and we want to teach and <laughs> how to prepare for spring. So uh, I'm just bioprotection. Um, I started like. Um, I've always been passionate about plants. It's uh, from my grandmother's side. She always taught me the wild plants in the forest, and she had a big garden. And I've always been interested in that. And uh, then I worked into a greenhouse. Uh, I went to school uh, in horticulture, and then I started to work uh, as a counselor for small fruit producer. And then I worked for the government too, and uh, the team, uh, the other team for different uh, and uh, disease across different crops. In the province of Quebec, here in Canada. So um, then, after that, I was still advising some small fruit producers and things like that, and I had to recommend them often some chemical pesticides. And I was really not sleeping well at night, uh, coming back in the field and seeing me everything dead. So uh, I said, no, I have to change something. And then I heard this opportunity, so I joined the Anetis Bioprotection in 2008. And uh, since then, uh, I've been. Uh, with the good guys and good girls trying to rebalance the the balance uh, in the natural ecosystem uh, by introducing predatory mites or uh, insects uh, to help uh, uh, gardeners uh, across Canada uh, and elsewhere to uh, to uh, have good healthy crops. 
So um, that's it. So uh, now I, I take care of the cannabis sector mainly. Uh, and that's it. So we help ACMPR growers and licensed producer across Canada to uh, have a healthy crop to build their IPM programs and all. So I'll let uh, everybody uh, also present themselves. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Anna Sweeney. And You're a bit quiet there, Dr. Anna. Oh, no. Is that better? I don't know. I don't have my... A little bit more, little bit more into the mic, at least. Uh, you got a little bit clearer there. I don't know if you're far from your mic or if you're close to it, but it, it seems like it's a distance. Is it too... It's still quiet. Let me... Yeah, a little bit faint. You want me to go to Ashley and then we'll come back? Sec, yeah. All right. Ashley, go ahead. Hey, everybody. My name is Ashley Hubbard. I am the Director of Cultivation for Rare Systems. We are in Michigan. We are fully aeroponic, which is always really fun to learn, but I'm um, really excited for this conversation. I myself have really started to learn and adapt different IPM strategies. Um, so really excited. And the more I learn about just the beneficials and the, you know, all the, all the good things that you can add to, like Claude said, keep the balance, I think is just so fascinating. So I'm always really excited to learn about the, the small microscope microscopic world, but um, we utilize beneficial insects and um, additives to our process. Um, so always excited to learn more. Anna, that's you. Is it better? Much. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> hi everybody, Dr. Anna here and uh, I am back. I guess I was gone last week. I had shingles. I still have shingles, but it's not as bad as it was last week. I'm really excited to learn about stuff today as um, the head of R&D for a aquaponic uh, certified organic grow facility. Uh, we we use bugs. Um, I have a little picture on my profile pic. I just found this little guy the other day, um, little baby praying mantis, so cute. Uh, we use lace wings and ladybugs and praying mantis, mantises and nematodes, but I don't know much about it. Um, so I'm excited to hear more and learn more. You're up, Matthew Gates. Give us the hey, everyone. My name is Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist, and I've been working in agriculture generally for 12 years now. Most of the work I've been doing has been with cannabis, but I also have quite a bit of experience with um, cut flowers, vegetables like tomatoes. Uh, for a period of time, I lived in China um, and I worked with tea growers there primarily, but also some vegetable growers as well. And I'm very excited to be here with Claude and talking about um, IPM strategies specifically for spring because that is a time when a lot of the insect life um, and other arthropods and other organisms for that matter um, sort of wake up and become way more active. And we can discuss some of the aspects that I like to often talk about. I have a Xenthanol IPM series um, here on the Future Canvas Project 02 channel and I also have uh, a YouTube channel, Xenthanol, and an Instagram at Sync Angel, where I post a lot of my educational content about plant health, uh, insect physiology, plant physiology, and that sort of a thing. And, and as usual, it is always invited for everybody to come in and check out our moderates and definitely follow and like them. If they, you hear something that you enjoy, I'm just going to make a quick note and just say, if you are in the room and you look forward to this conversation go ahead and share and post that out there so that we can get more people in the room to enjoy the conversation with us dr mark you're right on time we're just doing introductions you want to give yourself a quick introduction we're going to get the roll the ball rolling today on spring bugs hey guys how are you apologize i'm listening to another conversation um yeah just got uh, back from the west coast Back on the East Coast, Dr. Mark, cannabis chemist. Thanks for the room, London. Yeah, I do anything having to do with the chemistry of the cannabis plant. So if anyone has any chemistry questions, fire away. Awesome. Well, I am looking forward to it. I am excited 
to really get things rolling. I want to like, so we, those that aren't, that aren't aware, I recently did kind of a bug release with uh, both of you where I happened to drop both of you onto the stage to have a conversation. And that's what kind of sparked this evening today, which is really exciting. Um, just a second, come up. I got little ones and it happens. But anyways, we sparked an amazing conversation, an opportunity to share a space with two people that I highly appreciate that are, are very interesting and very much into bugs. Um, we released some of these new whirly gig crazy mite things, and these are voracious eaters that manage to do a number on a large aphid population. Like, I mean, these things are nuts. They're, they're very interesting. We'll get into some of the more specifics with that. But I'd like to open up the conversation with going to you, Matthew Gates, as you are our special, second special guest for the night, cause here on the regular. So you get a little bit of extra love tonight. But what do you see? What are kind of the first pests and issues that often come up? And then I'm probably going to bounce over to Claude and ask, what are some of the techniques and things that we can do to prevent and, and create a good environment to maintain a balance in our space coming into this spring thing? But we want to get the ball rolling there, Matthew. Yes, absolutely. So um, in my experience working with people specifically in cannabis, um, and also a lot of these pests of cannabis that are very common are also common pests on other agricultural crops. So maybe the step zero thing is to acknowledge that um, cannabis pests don't have to be specialized on cannabis. And indeed, for those who don't know, it is actually very common to get pests from um, surrounding area, um, especially if you live near agricultural um, areas and things like this. So some of these pests that are really common, especially in spring, would be like the two-spotted spider mites and other spider mites. Um, the binomial name is Tetranchus urtici. I recently did a IPM series video on its extremely, extraordinarily um, potent detoxification physiology on um, this channel with uh, Chad Westport. So you should check that out if you're curious to know uh, exactly how it's able to feed on plants in the way that it can and so gregariously. Um, aphids are also really common, I would say, during springtime, especially in North America and um, Europe. And there are several different kinds of species. The ones you have to worry about in cannabis would be the rice root aphid and the cannabis aphid most primarily, but there are uh, indications. I've certainly observed other species sort of transiently colonizing cannabis. Uh, I think that's a good one to start with, except for also maybe Western flower thrips or onion thrips and thrips in general are very common in the springtime and they kind of ramp up as the temperature increases. Now, before we jump over to Claude and kind of ask what your what your plan or plan of action might be at this exact point in time, I'd love to know, Matthew. Because um, so a question sparked up in my mind when you were speaking and you mentioned that if you live close to agricultural spaces, that there is a higher probability of pest interaction. And is this more regularly observed in, say, agricultural spaces that are monocropping or doing large volume of singular types of crops? Or like, are we talking as people that are kind of like, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of local natural space. Um, so there's a lot of environment around me and there's a lot of forests. Um, here in North Vancouver, which is it's quite lovely, but I'm not exactly surrounded by agricultural land. So I wonder if the type of land and the balance that's around there is playing a key factor into these influences. That's an excellent question. Um, Non-agricultural flora are an incredibly resilient and useful place for various pest species to harbor. So not just because agricultural fields, but also uh, indeed, many pests are well known for traveling through maybe natural waterways or ravines um, and other sort of undergrowth, especially even natural plants that um, that are native to the area. Um, so it's not really a guarantee that if you're growing in a space that's very close to a forested zone um, or sort of a very biodiverse area that you're not going to necessarily encounter pests. And in fact, a lot of those plants can also be, sometimes at least, um, uh, hosts for those various plant parasites. But they are, I would say, um, the reason why a lot of domesticated plants are really suitable hosts is because um, a lot of their defense compounds and other defensive structures have been um, 
spread out through domestication unintentionally of course people didn't really know what they were <laughs> doing at that level um you know millennia ago but um that is one factor of many um, monoculture is also another factor having large swaths of these plants that um, don't have those uh, resistance factors certainly as the virulence of those pests and their um, their sheer number and their ability to grow rapidly awesome and i think with a great question comes an amazing response that was well put so claude you're up next. What am I going to want to do in your average situation going into, you know, the, I know this is, this is a terribly unprecise question <laughs> because it's a little rough. What, what are the first three steps or pest prevention methods um, that either include using natural or organic pest solutions or using the release of, of, of living insects? Do you suggest um, going into spring is your best preparation to you know, ensure that you're going to have the best crop possible. It's about often when people are growing cannabis, um, there is, you know, one crop the whole season. So if you have one, like in Canada, you get four plants. That's that's all you get if you if you if you don't have your medical license. So a lot of people, these four plants, they put a lot of value in it. They try and get a lot of their crop out of the year. You know, they're not smoking much. But what can these people do to ensure that a balance is created right off the bat that's going to create a situation that's optimum for our plant growth and to have as little problem in the future as possible. Look, some problem is part of the solution, but you know, what, what can we do to really line that up correctly? So first of all, you have to, uh, to know um, the site you are at and what region zone you are, uh, what type of weather it is, the history, what what kind of pests lurks around um what you had previous history what you have previous experience with uh, is a good indicator to how to prepare yourself um also um the thing is we're talking about the surrounding fields uh, the experience i had uh, was mainly with monocrop um let's say people were growing hay or wheat or spring wheat or things like that and then they would uh, harvest, uh, do a, a cutting of the hay or uh, or wheat, and then there would be an invasion of trips that would come over on the cannabis field. Um, so that kind that could happen sometimes uh, because of a, an agricultural field nearby. Um, I, I believe maybe the forest surroundings uh, is more balanced. Uh, there'll be more pests uh, and predators uh, uh, also at the same time present. So there'll be less of a, of a problem there. Uh, when you, um, the same thing with cannabis or cabbage or any type of seedling or small plantlet, will often get uh, flea beetles. Um, we don't have any really any predators for it, but you can always spray cold water on them and they'll just uh, chase them for half a day. Uh, they like uh, to have it um, to to have uh, really hot conditions, and they like it sunny, and they they're always around, and they could be a nuisance to the plant. This, those tiny little black flea beetles, uh, when at the start, um, after a couple of uh, notes, uh, there's no worries. They'll do minimal damage on the leaves. So this we have to watch. Uh, I think it's pretty common in North America. Uh, I'll have to check um, where it is exactly the its range, but um, this is something we have to check. Um, also, um, like we had said in the previous episode, um, companion planting um, to have an assortment. If you if they're not present naturally, try to have as many plants uh, plants that are rich in pollen and nectar to feed off uh, the predators. Um, also. Um, it depends, are you growing in pots or in the ground? If you're growing in pots, uh, certain invertebrates could, um, like the um, cucumber beetle, um, could like, its larva could be uh, damaging sometimes in certain areas. Um, so I would then recommend to introduce a predatory mite like um, Stratulilaps or Gelolaps, um, which uh, Stratulilaps is still known as under his own name, Hippoaspis. So if if it's in the ground, there's no need. There's already 
uh, uh, predators present naturally, but in a pot uh, with um, with uh, potting soil, uh, then they're just pests. That they're going to show up usually, so uh, then we have to prevent that uh, by putting these resident uh, predatory mites inside the pots. Um, uh, this would be a good a good way. Um, also, if you have caterpillars issue, uh, the borers or any um, other type of uh, caterpillars, um, we have trichogramma wasps that you can um, also uh, release in advance in the season when you know, um, like the the corn borer won't happen in the west uh, on the west coast. It's just on the east coast. Uh, but there's other type of caterpillars that could be um, taken care with trichogramma. Uh, I will speak more about them uh, later. I will uh, take uh, uh, lead my 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 place to somebody else. <laughs> In other words, you need a moment to have a puff, which is an excellent point of uh, uh, of taking a pause and taking a moment and talking about that because I think <laughs> it's, it's super important to get these like balances sorted out right at the start because you can really set yourself up in the long run now one thing that often happens is that i'd like to take a moment because this question was asked in chat i think we got a good opportunity to do this one major problem um, and i'm going to start with giving both of the experts a good break here because i know for a fact ashley has a fantastically clean facility that takes amazing care and she has some awesome protocols in place at a larger scale that we don't usually talk about in, in a lot of these settings and I think it would be really interesting to kind of bring that up and what protocols you use in your space to kind of ensure that we keep the that we prevent as much introduction as possible because we're going to more than likely introduce pests through pet pets animals and stuff like that how frequently that happens who knows um, I'm sure Matthew Gates will talk about that in a moment, but I'd love to know, actually, from your perspective, what are you doing in your facility to kind of ensure that this uh, is as minimal as a risk as possible? Because you also encourage a lot of your home uh, growers and people that really care to go home and grow some. It's not an issue for you at all, too. So I think it's important to to talk. Yeah, so first and foremost, um, we change into scrubs. So if you guys are getting ready to walk into your garden and you've been around somebody else's plants. Um, you can always think about just doing a quick clothing change. We wear scrubs. Um, you would be surprised at how much um, can be brought into your building just on everybody's outside clothes. So we always change out of ours, but we, um, we try to be as preventative as possible. You can never fully control everything but if you can start clean stay clean that's always kind of the second step so we like to um, when we're taking cuts we'll kind of dip dip our clones before they leave the, the mother's room so we don't mix uh, excuse me we dip our plants in stuff oil before they leave any room so in between them being a clone going to the clone room. And then when they're leaving the veg to, to become a veg plant, we dip them again. So we try to just assume that we need to prevent everything that we can. So no plant is moved without being dipped. And then we like to utilize beneficial insects at various times throughout our growth. So we like to introduce them week one of flower and then we replenish them week five of flower and we use sachets so we like to use a, um, a general list so cucumeris will get a sachet and put one on every plant um, those plants are in our flower rooms for about nine weeks so we like to make sure we replenish them at least once but sachets are really cool because you can Put them on a plant. You want to make sure they're in the canopy area, but they are a slow release. So whatever beneficials that you've identified is what you want to put on your plants. Um, you'll just hang these little sachets on the canopy at canopy heights, and they are uh, slowly release um, these beneficial insects over about, um, a, I'd say, two and a half to four weeks on the species timeline 
so it's good protection. Ooh, Let you faded in out there for a second there, Ashley. Your audio went a little bit off. How's it now? Uh, you want to? I think your mic just might have gotten tucked into your hair. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> um, so we, yeah, so we will utilize these beneficial sachets to be um, kind of our protection throughout flower. But we um, start clean, move plants, assuming that you know we're gonna move a clean plant to a room, and then we try to just take good care to make sure that they've got protection throughout their whole course. But something that I really enjoy doing, and I think it's just been a win-win for our company is, you know, I encourage my team to, to grow at home. You know, I don't want to stifle their creativity, but also want to be smart about what it means for us as a business. So I intentionally grab a couple um, additional sachets and I will hand those out to my home growers. So give them a sachet. It helps protect their plants as well as protect the ones that are protect our plants at work. So um, I thought that that was always a, a really cool thing to to kind of inspire them to do the same thing at, at their at their house. You know, start clean, let's let's grow clean plants and we can uh, make preventative take preventative measures. Um, but yeah, that's what that's what we do at work, and uh, it's it's worked out really well. We like to um, also utilize some delosha on our moms, so um, yeah, that's what we do. Awesome! And how great is it to have a full aspect and view of like the situation? I love being able to go from small to big. I think it's really important and really, really helpful. Um, so I will bring this up now. We are about half an hour into the show and we are talking about bug and pest prevention come spring and how to best situate ourselves. Now, I'd love to uh, pop down to Matthew and ask him, you know, what is what is a common issue that he's running into at this point in time? Are there some questions that are commonly sorted out? And if you could get a couple out of the way, if there was one particularly that you would love to get out of the way and get known, it, would you like to say that so at this point? Uh, well, I just put it in the live stream chat for YouTube. And that's that basically, it's a very good idea to set up some sort of a quarantine, whether you're a commercial grower or whether you're a home grower. Um, if you're growing and you're getting clones or cuttings from people, then it's an extremely good idea because there are various pests that are invisible when they first colonize, like in the case of certain microbes like powdery mildew, they're virtually impossible to see for the first many dozens of hours of, um, of the colonization process of germination. Uh, obviously, certain viral agents can be difficult to see, like hop latent viroid, um, which at this point almost feels cliche to talk about since, at least for the specialists that I work with, um, this is an incredibly big deal for so many people. Um, and also even like thrips, like, uh, you know, many thrips use an ovipositor uh, and they inject basically the egg into the dermal tissue. So even if you were to wipe out all the thrips, you can't necessarily see uh, that the eggs are still there beneath the tissue and then they hatch as nymphs and you're wondering where they came from. You were very, um, you know, you were very visually comprehensive and you're looking out and you're crop scouting. Uh, but yeah, just situational awareness in general, having a quarantine process if you can uh, manage that. And also on top of that, um, like Claude said earlier, simply like being aware of the pests that are possible for you to get just generally, like for the crop that you're growing, in this case, cannabis, understanding their life cycle, um, and then also recognizing the signs of their presence, like their damage, and also what their bodies look like at various life stages. Learning that, pre-priming yourself with that information is invaluable, in my opinion. Awesome. Do you have a a similar opinion there, Claude, or shall we move on? Because I'd love to get, because usually what I've often been told at this point in the year is a bit about nematodes and like, let's get a soil drench in there. So do you want to talk about that? Because I think they're, they're, they're a confused and used 
product that I don't know is always being used appropriately. And I, I think I'd, I'd love to ask you a little bit about that because there's a lot of people going to be using uh, nematodes, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, to kind of, you know, for their grass, but also as preventive, preventative. And Russell, welcome to the stage. Uh, Russell, awesome guy. we're going to allow him some space earlier later. But how, Quad, what's up with nematodes? Okay, uh, just before I just wanted to to point uh, to to uh, complete a bit. Uh, uh, also, not just clones that get from friends, but I had also uh, tales of people that had plants outside and they wanted to bring back inside. So when you bring back inside plants that were outside, you uh, it's really a, a lottery. You might get a lot of things that you weren't expecting in the first time in your life, as you see. So uh, this could be uh, something that you have to check. And also, that's it. Even if your friends they tell you, tell you their, their uh, plants are clean and everything like that, and they're really uh, honest and everything, but they don't even know themselves that they have um, issues. And especially, like uh, Matthew was saying, those elusive trips. Uh, there's always one that lays eggs somewhere or hides somewhere. And, somewhere in a vein or like somewhere really really well hidden that you don't see it's going to restart everything so um this you have to really really make sure um the um, so uh, also uh, concerning the the nematodes uh, you have to know what pest you're um fighting to get the right species of nematode uh to fight them um, nematodes come in the variety of uh, substrate uh, according diff from different companies. Uh, some come in clay, some come in gel, some as a uh, organic gel, some it's a uh, dietary assert is really popular these days, a uh, uh, food grade, uh, fine uh, dietary assert uh, that's not an insecticidal. Um, they, they also come in um, on sponges. So when you get uh, the nematodes, you uh, you will dissolve them in the water, um, so that you will be able to uh, uh, apply them. Um, so uh, according to what pest you're fighting, you'll know how much volume you need to reach them. Uh, let's say you have, you want to reach grubs that are deep in the ground, then you have to have an important volume of water. So I would I would always advise is to Make sure that your pots or your lawn has always been has been watered nicely before, uh, meaning there's no dry pockets anywhere because the nematodes really need uh, free water to uh, travel and find their prey and survive. So uh, you want them to travel everywhere um, as much as you can. Um, it's important also when you mix in the nematodes into the water to use it immediately. Uh, some people will prepare a solution and do something else. Uh, they'll suffocate. They, if you don't have a area, a good aerator uh, to uh, give oxygen to these nematodes, they'll they'll die uh, of lack of oxygen. So that's another important thing to consider. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, you have to use them at the right temperature and also at the right time. Uh, I won't go over all pests, but um, there are certain periods in the year that you have to use in the methods and sometimes it isn't worth it. You just waste your money. I mean, uh, they won't be able to target the pest at the right uh, stage or uh, something like that. So uh, that, that is what I, I would say to that. Oh, and also, uh, just to finish, uh, uh, also what uh, I think it was uh, Ashley was saying, I think, uh, about sachets. Uh, sachets are great inside or even in a greenhouse, but never use them outside. It's not worth it. Um, the first rain will, will ruin them. Uh, it will destroy the, in the the climate, even if they come in this fi fancy packaging some companies have. Um, even then, uh, I heard these companies sometimes advise the cannabis growers, uh, the large, the licensed producer has 100,000 plants, and they would put a sachet of Swirsky and Californicus on each 100,000 plant every week. <laughs> so they spent a lot of money for nothing. Uh, one so, of the, yes, not to interrupt, but one of the problems is because of the sunlight, right? Uh, it just bakes them. It just makes the mites come out of the packages too quickly. 
Exactly, exactly. That's the first point. Sorry, the first ex most important point is not even the rain. It is the, the even if they're well hidden in the canopy, uh, even if it's a really leafy plant, they, have, they don't have a chance. So uh, then uh, we have to do uh, uh, we have to do some bulk release. Uh, and always like uh, for predatory mites, I would only use uh, Neosilus phalasis outside because it's a native mite and always in Canada. I don't know about California, uh, maybe other species, maybe Californicus there, you would have to tell us, uh, or Persimilis would be good. But um, Phallus, Neosilus phallasis would be the mite I would release in Canada. Uh, we, do, we use them um, with raspberry growers and they become resident. So they introduce them one time and they uh, usually they see them uh, year after year after that. And uh, so this I would do. Um, so I will leave the the, the, the the mic to somebody else, but uh, I will come back about that because um, it's not all predatory mites or uh, insects that we can release outside that are efficient. It's not the same as inside uh, or in greenhouse uh, settings. Um, so, like I would never use ladybugs outside. It's not worth it. They'll just fly off with the first breeze. Um, especially the wild harvested ones, I think they'll have a tendency to go want to go back home. So, <laughs> anyways, I'll let uh, Matthew or other, any other uh, people uh, continue. I have a question. Um, so, I've always heard that certain pumps will actually harm nematodes. So, we had to hand water ours in for a certain application at my last grow. Is that um, is that correct? That you have to be careful with what kind of pump if you're going to try to water them in. That's my understanding, Claude. Totally, especially the filters. You have to watch for you. They, you um, have to remove your fine uh, mesh filters. Uh, they won't go across that. Um, and it's, it's it, sometimes people have no choice because it's the setting. Uh, they have so many plants, uh, such a big uh, facility and everything like that, and uh, lack of, uh, of uh, staff and, and uh, time. So they have to, and they, it's, they find it practical. But the best way is to, if you can do it, is to do with them individually. Uh, then you know that you have a good drench, you have a little um, leach uh, under the pot uh, that you know that you've reached everywhere, um, especially this, your uh, trying to come uh, to fight uh, fungus gnats. Certain times of fungus gnat not, will just be on the top soil. They'll be around the, the drainage hole. So uh, that way, if you want to get them from the nematodes, you have, in fact, almost no choice to get um, everywhere the, the, the nematodes everywhere. So you want to make sure that they're going to drain in the bottom of the pot. If it's in a hydroponic system, that's it. You remove your filters. Um, you make sure there's not too much agitation either, um, and you're gonna lose some in the in the pipes and the in the tubes, and the, that will never make it to their prey. Uh, so it's not the best way, but sometimes they, they have no they have no choice. So this kind of brings up a question that's popped up into my head. Actually, you know what? I've got another one first because I got to do Dr. Anna a, a favor here because she's got this beautiful picture of a mantis up as, as oh, wait, I got to show it on the other. The YouTube side doesn't see it. So I got to be able to fix that. But anyway, so she's got a beautiful picture of a mantis up and mantises are cool as hell, but they aren't like the ideal pest preventer, you know, like they're just... They, they, they get big and then they eat large things. And a lot of the problems with cannabis and a lot of vegetables in general are really that large things don't get at them too hard. So I'd love to know if there is some methodology or thoughts on how to appropriately use mantis in a way that might be intelligent for a home. And there's one over at Matthew because Claude just spoke. But is there like can we pace them out and release them so that they're maintained small is there or is it ideal to drop them all at once um what's kind of you know thought process going on 
Generally, I don't support the use of praying mantids in indoor or outdoor cultivation, primarily because, uh, like I think we've talked on another stream potentially, um, they're too big. And like you've also acknowledged as well, even as nymphs, um, they're pretty large still. And a lot of the, well, a lot of the really precarious pests that we're dealing with, like spider mites, thrips, aphids, um, russet mites, broad mites, not counting the things that are insects, of course. Um, they're way too small, really, to be an effective prey target for um, for praying mantids. The sorts of things I could think of that might be more relevant. And, um, of course, I want to put, put my cards on the table and say that I am biased because um, of where I live. Um, you know, I live in Southern California. Um, I've worked in other places, of course, and um, I make it a, a habit to become familiar with other parts of the world, especially places where I'm going to visit. And um, so other places might have more pests and I can think of things like maybe caterpillars as an example that might be an attractive target or maybe certain beetle species potentially. But um, ultimately I don't feel like they have enough of a um, sort of what we call an attack rate for, um, you know, compared to like other sort of uh, pest eating predators or parasitoids. Uh, the kill rate's just too low for a lot of these pests because they reproduce so rapidly and they're also too small, um, essentially. And also on top of that, if you care about such things, although it would be very difficult to root out things like the Chinese mantis in the North America, but um, a lot of these praying mantids are not native to the area that you're utilizing them. So from an ecological perspective, there might be um, a, a deleterious effect if you're applying them often, um, or at least a disruptive effect to the native wildlife around. If that's something that's important to somebody who's cultivating or um, managing uh, a land area. Yes, if I can add about the praying mantids, um, we've been warned by the Association of National uh, Biocontrol Producer, which uh, we are a part of to stop trade of uh, Chinese mantids, uh, any type of mantids, and also of convergent lady beetle. Um, because um, they are wild harvested usually, so that's not really ethical. And like Matthew just said, they can disrupt uh, uh, natural ecosystems uh, if people are not careful where they release them. And also they're not as efficient predators. They're really spectacular. It's, that's what makes the beauty of them and where the, they're so spectacular, and the, there's so many YouTube channels like showing fights of them with between different like uh, crazy other insects, and so uh, they're really really spectacular. And we used to sell them before when I arrived at Nanetsis um, uh, to schools and things like that, and people just as novelty and just like for education. And uh, but now we we cannot sell them anymore, and we we don't. Uh, it's still on our old. Uh, on our website, but our new website is coming in very soon, which has been warned by Applied from by, by Brian. He said uh, he wasn't pointing us uh, directly, but uh, uh, he said we have to remove that uh, <laughs> this page, this ghost page, because we haven't sold any in two years. But uh, so that's it. The praying mantids are really nice to look at. They're really spectacular, and they could be efficient predator for certain things. But like uh, Matthew said, also at the rate. Uh, the reproduction rate of uh, the pests that we're dealing with, it's not, um, it, it is not the, 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 the predator that we, uh, we, uh, we want. Uh, I mean, uh, we've, it's not our preferred. I also want to add that um, for the lady beetles, I've posted about this several times, but um, some of these wild harvested lady beetles are also Harmonia axaridis, which is the um, harlequin lady beetle. And that's an invasive species in North America and other parts of the world. Um, it's from Asia. And the major problem with it is that it will eat other lady beetle species that are native. So that's a problem. Um, on top of that, it will vector um, a disease. I think it's a microsporodian. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's kind of like a fungus. Uh, and basically, that will be vectored through um, to other lady beetles too, as well. 
and um, it's just not really great. It's just, you know, just a parasite, essentially, of Lady Beetles. So on top of all those things as well, um, they can bite people. <laughs> and, um, and they tend to aggregate in massive quantities during fall and winter so that they can overwinter. And that's, where pe- that's a major way that people wild harvest them. So they destroy uh, habitat in order to do that. Um, and then also some of these will sort of overwinter in places that you don't want, like close to your house. And uh, for some people, that can be pretty annoying or um, alarming. So, yeah, I would definitely advocate for people to learn about some of these biocontrol agents and not just the insects, but also fungi. I'm a big fan of uh, like Puveria bassiana or Isaria fumosorcia. These are two enzyme pathogenic fungi that are commonly used against insects, but they have a broad host range. So I think that it's important for us to be cognizant of that and consider that when we're trying to use um, these organisms in a, um, a strategic fashion. So Matthew, I have a question. Um, you call it the Harlequin lady beetle. Is that the same as what I've heard called the Japanese lady beetle? And they also like vomit up this like gross yellow stuff that gets all over your plants as well if you have them on. Is that the same bug? It might be. I actually don't hear it called that, but um, this is a great opportunity to say that uh, common names for insects and other arthropods is very varied. Uh, one only needs to talk about pill bugs and the various names that people have um, for them, which are, you know, roly polies and that sort of a thing. Um, so that does sound like a characteristic that they do have. Uh, I think the Harlequin Lady Beetle does sort of like evert like a, 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 a foul smelling yellow liquid as a defense mechanism as well. Um, so it could be what you're talking about as well. And Harlequin lady beetles also, for those who don't know, they have a multitude of phenotypes. So some of them look like, you know, uh, red lady beetles with black spots. Sometimes they're totally black. Sometimes they are um, other various colors as well. So that's kind of where the name comes, like a Harlequin mask. They can like change their appearance very, um, very often. And I think that's actually kind of amazing. but. Unfortunately, I can't appreciate it too much. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it stinks really much. <laughs> and here in Quebec, especially uh, northern latitudes, they really need the heat to overwinter. So they get into the barns and everything. I saw some farmers uh, rip up an old wall in the barn and there was like millions. I agree that they all like uh, stuck together. Um, so no, they 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 compete with the five hundred and sixty three species I think we have, and they've they've won, so it's not a good idea. I think they've been introduced in the Midwest in Ontario with about thirty years ago, uh, in the greenhouse, and they didn't realize that yeah they're gonna fly off the vents and they're gonna go outside, and that's what happened. So uh, we used to sell them uh, the convergence lady uh, lady beetle, not the not the Asian one. We used to sell them like by. 36,000, 72,000 like bags, but now it's over with climate change, the well, uh, West Coast wildfires, and now the warning we had, and also we were against that uh, for ethical reasons. We have other predators that are as efficient, and it's just that people, people uh, when they know, they, they learn about biocontrol, the first things they, they know about is ladybird, the beetle, the ladybug, the, that's the symbol of a biological control, that's why they and like Anetsis is the name of a species of <laughs> lady beetle. So, go ahead, Doctor Mark. If you like, I have a question for you that I uh, that I should over. I'd love to know. <laughs> I love to know I, what happens I, to all these bugs I put in my weed. I have more questions than answers. But I, Lamia, did we talked about this? Um, on a on a, on a, a clubhouse once before. I, I, I'm not sure if it was this this room, but um, in my previous life, I uh, 
I explored, well, actually, I'm still exploring this plant. It's a very interesting plant. The plant we know is catnip, right? So uh, Nepeta cateria, I think, is, is the most common of them, right? Catmint, it's commonly known as catnip. So catmint is actually, I think, in the same um, genus as... Um, um basil and cannabis i think they're 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 all in that same branch of the plant kingdom of the, 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 the oil yeah the oil expressors so like so similar similar to cannabis um catmint expresses its oil in glandular trichomes on the leaf surface and and they're very they're very odd looking. If you've ever seen the the trichomes of cannabis, I know there's a few images up there on the web, but we actually um, looked at them underneath the microscope, and they do they have kind of like that that sessile uh, uh, gland, uh, sort of just round you know orb like looking you know uh, trichome that sort of sits on the leaf surface. But you know, and the, and the interesting thing about about the essential oil of catmint is is it's enriched with a compound called nepetalactone, and nepetalactone is the thing that that is responsible for the 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 activity in in felines, right? And that is conserved through the feline kingdom, so it happens to our our little domestic friends as well as the big cats in the jungle. You know, they respond. To that they want to listen to jazz and, and eat Twinkies, um, you know. So um, it's kind of cool. But the, the the how it's appropriate to this discussion, Claude, is you were talking about beneficial plants. You know, um, uh, uh, catmint Nepeta cataria attracts lacewings, and you know lacewings are are pretty good predators for for aphids. I I I don't know. I know there's a little bit of discussion about using lace wings uh as a integrated pest management control species for cannabis uh i don't know if you y'all have any exposure uh or, or uh, any uh experience with lace wings but i would think that again a beneficial plant to have in your garden uh would be uh nepeta cataria uh it's really pretty and uh, gets your cats high <laughs> It makes an interesting tea too, as well. I guess uh, people used to drink uh, the tea of catmint for stomach ailments. Uh, Nepetalactone itself is is an insect repellent, uh, but at high concentrations, it's uh, it it actually is a, it, it induces an allergic reaction, a skin sensitization. So you may want to be careful with the essential oil itself. But the last thing I'll say is that. Um, Lace wings are, are kind of like, I think they're in that same family as, as stink bugs because if you do crush a lace wing, it's got a scat hole in it, which is 3 methyl indole, which uh, is a really interesting compound because at very um, low concentrations, uh, 3 methyl indole smells almost floral. Uh, or orangey, citrusy, I think, more floral than anything. But in high concentrations, <laughs> it, it literally smells like shit. Um, it literally has got the smell of feces. In fact, I think its origin is from the decomposition of the amino acid tryptophan. And so when it de when that amino acid decomposes you get you get scatol and scatol is just yeah it's just a really stinky compound so it might be like kind of like stink bugs when you when you squish a lace swing it might smell your fingers might smell a little bit <laughs> this is dr mark thanks <laughs> well fun fact um nepetalactol uh is something that a lot nepetalactone. of no, no no i know that I, I heard what you said, and I'm saying that a different compound. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the lactol. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, and also, I'm very curious because I don't have the strongest uh, biochem. First of all, it's such a, a diverse discipline. Uh, but I'm curious to get your opinion on this. So apparently there's a, an epetolactol 
that induces a response in Forodon humuli, which is the hop aphid or the damson hop aphid, um, which is a close relative to the cannabis aphid, Forodon cannabis. And I guess apparently it's very attractive to them and also perhaps Ropalosiphum patty, which is very closely related to Ropalosiphum rufi abdominale, the rice fruit aphid. Many people have encountered both the cannabis aphid and the rice root aphid. And I guess found a whole lot of research on um, cannabis aphid physiology specifically. But that was, that's an interesting thing. Whenever somebody mentions nepetalactone, I immediately think of this research report, which um, you can find in my pest primer video on the cannabis aphid on my YouTube channel, uh, Zenfenol. Um, and I always like to talk about this because people often ask about the sort of the ability for breeding plants that have sort of resistance traits, of course, uh, having certain compounds that would be negatively effective, phytotoxic to insects, but also potentially even just repellent from like a volatile perspective, like could they produce enough that, you know, the the parasite will not want to be on the plant. And um, I've mentioned in other places, but insects and also predators, insect predators, for example, like parasitic wasps. And I'm curious to hear Claude's uh, opinion on this as well, that um, their response to these chemistries can be kind of plastic. It can, it can change quite a bit. And of course, that's uh, that makes sense, right? Because um, what works in one environment might not work in another. So there's a bit of a selection pressure there um, for that. And uh, yeah, so I just want to bring that up. Um, so yeah, it's called it's a nepetalactol. I have it here for me, and um, and nepetalactone. Yeah, actually, both of these. Yeah. So um, I don't have the research report on top on on my uh, uh, right here, but I can get it to you and I can put it in the comments if you'd like to take a look at it in the future. Anyone who's listening. Yeah. So th that family, those bicyclic um, iridoid monoterpenoids, are are um, found throughout um, the insect kingdom too as well matthew so actually what we did so we we found that if you hydrogenate nepetalactone it converts it into dihydronepetalactone and and nepetalactone itself to so the essential oil of catnip which is typically enriched with um nepetalactone on the order of about 70 to 85 percent so kind of like what cannabinoids is to to cannabis extracts to to essential oil of catmint the the monoterpenoids that you find in there let's see we used to find carvone in there we would find beta caryophylline and osamine and a couple of the common terpenes and sesquiterpenes that you find in cannabis which i always thought was interesting and when you hydrogenate the the the, the oil itself all those all those terpenes also get hydrogenated but kind of like the cool thing that we couldn't um, predict until we actually did the chemistry was the essential oil of catmint is very loud and herbaceous. In fact, it's it's um, some people find it very objectionable. It's got like kind of like a freshly mowed grass kind of smell or like kind of like wet hay kind of smell. Smells very, do I have to make sure my parents are out of the house when I do this project of? <laughs> of <laughs> yeah. Now, now you, you, you spark it but, you've got to do it. But anyways, but the cool thing, the cool thing on it is, is a, a, after you hydrogenate it, the essence of the oil changes from wet, freshly mowed grass to lemony, minty, with a hint of licorice. It's like the craziest thing ever. So actually the hydrogenated oil is an EPA approved insect repellent. This is a project I worked on many years ago. And there's a company that's commercializing that. So it's a plant derived um, insect, natural insect repellent. And it turns out hydrogenation, like I was saying earlier, um, improves the safety of the compound as well as the, the, 
the fragrance of the compound. So it's it's not so objectionable to, to have on your skin when it smells lemony, minty, with a hint of licorice. But if you walk around smelling like catmint oil, people might want to stay away from you as well as bugs. <laughs> so the research report, for those who are curious to put it in the live stream chat on YouTube, it's called uh, pheromone traps for the dis dissemination of an entomopathogen pathogen by the Damson Hop aphid board on Humuli, published in Biocontrol Science and Technology in 2001. And yeah, so they were looking at that um, as a potential um, volatile that could be used as an attractant. And then, of course, maybe for an auto inoculation trap. So you. Um, you know, you, you mix some sort of an entomopathogenic fungus and some sort of a uh, carrier, and then you dope it with, you know, some sort of attractant, or you put something close by that's an attractant, and then they come around, usually males. I believe this study was for males. Um, and, uh, or actually, no, that's not possible. <laughs> I mean, it is possible, but most uh, aphids usually don't have male forms. That's actually a really important point to make for those who don't know. Uh, there are sometimes males that are produced, but by and large, they're usually females that reproduce clonally with live birthed offspring, uh, which is pretty interesting. So that's called telescoping generations. Um, but uh, yeah, I did put in my re in my pest primer video, and it's an interesting subject, I think, for people because I feel like it it does get a lot more research lately, but it's kind of hard to utilize because um, a lot of times for many insects, chemistries uh, that are like endogenously produced, like pheromones, um, especially for mating or for aggregation or something like this, uh, those are oftentimes, uh, in a lot of cases, the, the volatiles that a plant produces and the ones that the parasite or other organism produces, uh, they work together and they have a synergistic effect for various organisms, either some that are using the, the volatiles as a guide to find food. <laughs> so in that case, it's a chiromone and not great for the sender, but great for the receiver. In other cases, it's a, you know, a cohort that is looking to um, uh, you know, find a, a mate or perhaps a, um, a colony mate potentially or some other sort of thing like that. I do find this stuff really fascinating. Have you ever, have you worked more, or do you have any more stories about uh, using traps in this way? Oh, I didn't address anyone in particular, but I suppose I meant Dr. Mark. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a chemist. I'm not, uh, uh, I happen to just work on this one insect repellent project, but I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a research chemist who, who doesn't do, uh, I, I don't cultivate, I don't grow. Um, I, I know the chemistry of the cannabis plant, but, um, um, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, uh, entomologist, but I've worked with entomologists and I've published in the journal of, uh, medical entomology, but uh, I, I'm just a chemist. I'm just a PhD chemist who, who yeah, who understands chemistry. That's all. Uh, we we distribute uh, different uh, pheromones against different pests um, with different traps uh, that you put in the, out in the field. So according to the season, uh, we have some for the sweat midge and different uh, crops like garlic and onions, things like that, and we have some for the corn borer too. Um, that will attract them. Um, so you know in advance when the pest is there, so you, you can begin your treatment or uh, introducing the predators that you need. I saw in the chat some people talking about bean plants. It is a really good idea. I even saw a licensed producer that the QA would let them do it. Uh, they would grow bean plants next to the cannabis plant, and these bean plants would uh, get the spider mites first if there were any spider mites in the facility. So that way uh, they could uh, remove the bean plants or, and know that the spider mites are there or treat the bean plants or uh, use the bean plants as a platform to release the predators uh, against the spider mites. I also saw in the chat somebody talking about grasshoppers. Um, 
there was a product that was available in Canada. Now it is just available in USA. It is um, Nosema Lacusta. Uh, the name of the product is Nolobate. So it's spores of, um, it is an entom entomopathogenic mushroom that is used against grasshoppers uh, as bait. Um, so it is available in the USA, but it won't be available in Canada until maybe next year. So uh, what happened is the, the plant that was uh, producing it burned down <laughs> in Canada. So uh, it's just been back in the USA. So it's called Nolobate, no, no the, the product, and it's a Nosema Lucusta. So that's the only thing I, I know about uh, how to control uh, in an organic way uh, grasshoppers. So if you could help anybody. Yeah. I think this is awesome and has led in a whole bunch of ways. Dr. Mark, I'm not going to lie. I have like, my wife has gone into plants and like wants to do the switchy stuff and she, she got a, like a still. So we're doing a bunch of like essential oils and stuff like that. And she has me planting so much stuff and, and we're going to just all just put it in there and see what the fuck happens. I'm very excited about it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll probably send you some videos of me doing something stupid at one point or another, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, London, the thing you have to realize too, with catmint oil, unlike most mint oils, so spearmint oil and peppermint oil will be on the top. Catmint oil is more dense than water. So actually catmint oil will follow fall to the bottom of your receiving vessel. If you're so in most, in most like. Are, are you doing a hydro distillation or a steam distillation? Steam. And you, do you know steam. the difference? Steam distillation. I'm just, I have like a really basic like pot steam setup. Yeah. So the plant material isn't in, isn't in the boiling water, is it? You're passing steam through it? No, then I would be the other way around. Sorry. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is called a hydro distillation. So if you add the plant material to your water and then just distill over the water and separate off the essential oil from that, um, that's called a hydro distillation. A steam distillation is, is different in that when you're doing is you're passing steam through the plant material and catching the volatiles on the other side of a condenser. Yeah, so the, the only nuance there, again, is that the catmint oil is slightly more dense than water, but it's only slightly more dense. And the problem that that creates is that you get a lot of incomplete oil disengagement in your hydrosol. So your hydrosol, and if you have cats around the house, they are going to be going nuts when you're doing this because there's all <laughs> kinds of volatiles. That will just come off the top of that, and the cats will just be going crazy. I think it's osamine is the most volatile terpene that you're going to get out of that. But um, yeah, I'll be interested in seeing the cats running around going crazy as you're distilling the stuff. <laughs> this is Dr. Mark. Bringing it back a little bit because of course we've got the bug brains in the in the house here and those that are in the audience if you enjoy the conversation don't forget to share post reshare do whatever you can to make sure and get out the conversation as much as possible um because i look forward to having it every single week with you guys and i hope you do too but we have our last 22 minutes left to go and i would like to ask because we've kind of gone down this wormhole of the other things that we can bring into our space the 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 companion planting as it were and this is the point in year where you're able to get some companion planting done so i'd love to ask the experts what are we you know what 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 are first we'll start with uh with with thought and then i'm sure we'll bounce over to matthews what are we suggesting to plant and put in right now and are there perennials that we can get started at any point in time that might be a good idea to just have on the property i know putting down beans is an excellent idea because it's always better to have something that will be attracted to them first is like your marker and i do that each year as well um but like what 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 could I be getting started now to help help myself start in that in this situation? Okay, you addressed the, that question to me? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, I see. Um so there's different uh, um, uh 
plant families that you could use uh, to plant outside to, to attract uh, predators. Um, it brings me up to the subject. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to talk about the aphid predator image. So if you have any issues of aphids uh, in your area, it is a good one to uh, introduce into your area. The aphid predator image, aphidolitas aphidimisa. Uh, also, I would to, to before I forget. There's another question about uh, springtails. Uh, yes, they are good usually uh, in your soil. They will transform uh, organic matter. Um, in if it's in your pots, it's usually uh, it will. Um, some people that are not too uh, fond of insects will be uh, kind of horrified because you could water your plants and from the drain holes you'll see hundreds of them coming out of the drain holes. And um, some people think they have rice with a fit or things like that. And I receive many pictures every week of people that, think too. Have, that have rice with a fit. And it's different types of columbola. <laughs> it's like uh, springtails. So, uh, no, usually they're not, yeah, unless you, you can control them with predatory mites like Stratolilaps uh, or Dalosia also will control some uh, things like that if you want to bring down the population. But Usually they're useful, you know, so they're not to be, uh, if you're not too scared of insects, then uh, you let them be. <laughs> yeah, I, I want I to, them. I want to back up that. I, I want to back up what Claude was saying about um, springtails. They're generally benign. I have, and mold mites too, for that matter, which are often feeder mites for predatory mites. Um, I'm asked about those perennially all the time. And people often mistake them for fungus gnats, which are a threat. and aphids like rice root aphids and also uh, predatory mites for that matter they sometimes get lumped into that group as well so yeah definitely try to learn your morphology i just want to suggest again that i do have uh, observational footage and videos about that on my youtube channel for those who are curious and i feel like it's a really helpful uh, learning tool because some of these uh, various arthropods can look very similar to each other so it's understandable that people get mixed up Bloody hard getting those little photos. I'll tell you what, though, uh, <laughs> which is great. So, can we? I, I'd like to know a little bit about if there's some. Actually, I'd like to say hello to Johnny um, because he is a regular here on the bank. I get to say hello. He was running a little bit late because of a tragedy. Um, I'm wondering if if you have an available moment, Johnny, since you're on the stage, and since we're actually in our hail mary last little bit here if you have any questions or comments go ahead and raise your hand and come up on stage here or if you're in the audience of future cannabis project on the youtube side go ahead and raise your hand or say something and ask a question now or forever hold your peace because we have like 15 minutes left of the show don't forget to share repost and do it because i think we've had a lot of a great content and stuff coming at you today and i hope you've enjoyed it all but johnny how are you doing and do you have a rasmus has a question for us Or you're on mute. Hey, sorry about that, London. Um, 
I, just, I heard, just heard my name popped up. I was just eating some food. Um, was there a question attached to that? Um, no, I was just saying how it's doing. You've had a stressful day and you, 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 you had some problems. So you had to do some hustling and, and stuff like that. I'm wondering if you had anything to say or a question. Um, oh, before, man. Yeah. yeah, I'm just so I'm devastated, dude. Like having to chop down plants uh, four or five weeks early. And like scramble, you know, I've taken care of these things. They were big, massive plants for the last couple months, and they're just starting to look amazing and smell amazing. And I just had to, had to like kill my kids pretty much. So, a little bummed, scrambling, but everything will be all right. And uh, sorry, I'm I'm late. Definitely seems like a good conversation up until this point. <laughs> thank you Johnny, for dropping in so i have a question that that is perfectly relative towards me and, and an issue and a question that I, that's been pondering in my head each year is i get a ridiculous amount of hoverbugs in the spring is this something that i should be worried about is this you know something that's common or an issue i find a lot of the times people jump too fast into defending and often what is you, you could do it you cause more harm than good you know it's like spraying you know pesticides after putting down a bunch of you know paid for insects it just doesn't make sense so is it like tell you is there something up with hover bugs is this a concern or do they show signs of other issues are you talking about hoverflies yes hoverflies hover, oh, hover hoverflies yes not hover bugs OK, other flies, the, the Europedes americanus, um, we distribute them now. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, uh, it's their larva that eats aphids. Uh, they're furtive, too. Um, they need the adults. They need pollen and nectar. They absolutely need um, that to be able to gather strength, and then they will lay their eggs. Um, so any plant, um, like companion planting, I really like, uh, just to come back to that, I really like uh, any kind of uh, um, clover uh, because it brings also nitrogen to the soil. Uh, uh, so red clover, white clover. And to bring back what Dr. Mark was saying, like any plant with nice essential, like peppermint, things like that, would be good. Uh, marigold are good. Sunflowers are good. Uh, Cerastium, uh, Sherville. Uh, there's many, many plants. It's just your... Uh, Imagination, in fact, is that are your growing uh, conditions is the limit. Uh, just to 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 uh, complete uh, is it your question from before, and um, um, so uh, yes, I'll pass on the mic. <laughs> yeah, I definitely wanted to support that. Uh, big fan of using cover flies where possible, and it's one of the probably one of the predators that I find the most common uh, that people don't really realize. So. Um, a lot of hoverflies in general can look kind of like wasps. They have this sort of a yellow black coloration, which is a form of mimicry to make things not bother it. Uh, the adults eat nectar and pollen, uh, like we said before, but the larvae are the ones that are eating usually aphids in, in this capacity. Um, they're pretty voracious predators too. And you can definitely attract them with uh, many flowers. I like, I find that it's a correlation, but like a lot of those plants that were just discussed that um, like the mint family groups, uh, which have a lot of little florets uh, or just small flowers in general um, that are very aromatic. I do find that those are super attractive to hoverflies for sure. And um, you can even get into a situation where you might attract aphids that don't feed on your cannabis plants in this, or whatever other crop you're, you're cultivating. And they can also be a little banker plant that way. Uh, it's too bad Russell uh, left early because when you asked about companion planting, I wanted to bring up that um, we've uh, we've worked on a project for using ornamental peppers. And we talked about that when we were doing the Whirly Gig Mite video, which people should check out on YouTube on FCP. Um, but uh, yeah, banker plants are a good idea in a lot of cases. I find that... Um, for many predators like predatory mites like cucumeris and swirsky and things like this, and even californicus, you can maintain them on these plants that produce pollen because they're able to eat it and they're also able to uh, feed and reproduce on it very rapidly. 
So it can be a great way to maintain them when there's no prey for them to feed on. I, I love like ornament. I, I love plants in general, but I, I, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I, I, it was unfortunate that he wrestled had to go because I was really ready, ready to ask a great question at him with it because he, he does a lot of work in that area. And I, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of the space as well. I mean, I've got a cover crop blend with like a few dozen different things. Um, one interesting plant that I've been really kind of fun of looking at, and, and this is a little bit off topic because we're talking about bugs, but I, I do really enjoy Peruvia black pin is something that I'm exploring right now. It has really interesting flavor. It's part of the marigold family. Um, I can never say the name Haku, 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 Haku. But never mind. I'm not going to try and butcher the name, but it's, it's otherwise known as Peruvian black mint. It is very delicious and has a really ar aromatic aroma. But one of the neat things about it is it has an exudate that it actually puts out, and it can it can fight back a lot of detrimental plot, plants like like um, blind weed and and and, by, and and a lot of the things that we have problems with around here. Um, so I was wondering, like we were talking about the chem the chemical you know, properties of, uh, of what they have there. Is there anything that's on the market that you guys are aware of that are utilizing a lot of these methods and, and natural kind of essential oils to control it? I know we mentioned one earlier, but can you like touch on that a little bit and, and why? If you want to get started, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, you cut off abruptly, so I didn't know if there was more to the question no sorry yeah no no problem um so the question just to reaffirm the question is about uh using compounds as a repellent or as a toxin yeah as, as a repellent or a toxin i mean like a repellent i can see i don't know like if there's a toxin that's going to be harmful to a bug but okay from a plant like does this does this make a lot of sense to me and then of course we're not spraying this stuff on flower but anyway I, i'm getting sidetracked because i've got like kids running around my feet yeah but you, you summed it up perfectly thank you excellent yeah no problem so yeah there's a lot of um i like to call them uh botanical insecticides although certainly they don't have to be insecticidal nor do they have to be botanical necessarily um, but a lot of compounds people are appropriating from various plants and the um, toxins that they produce uh, are totally safe for other plants, or at least in the concentrations that we use them. Remember, the dose makes the poison. So, and, and on that note, um, I, I remember in the spider mite video that I did with Chad Westport, uh, we were talking about chemical um, you know, chemical agents that you can use that are reduced harm, that are uh, not going to uh, very significantly negatively affect your plant or other organisms. And erythritol was uh, found in a research report recently at about 30%. And uh, you can check out the research report that I cite in that video um, for more information. Basically, they found that they applied it and it was actually very negatively uh, um, antagonistic to spider mites, as well as their eggs, I think, if I remember right. And this is an artificial sweetener for those who don't know. And it was very minimally, it wasn't even lethal to the predatory mites like Persimilis. Um, it was very minimally negative to them. And primarily it was negative in that it would stick on their bodies and they would have to clean themselves. And uh, traversing the plant body was a little bit more onerous, but basically it worked out really well. That's awesome. And I want to touch back on one last thing, because the last time we were together, we happened to have the opportunity to like be shooting these these Whirligig mites. Uh, and I, I want you like they, they have cleared out the space really, really quite well. There's still some population there. But like, Claude, can you tell like what what the what is with these things? They're absolutely nuts. Um, and my, my question is, what's the apple like? What is their rate of birth like? Is it are they out populating the aphids or are they out eating the aphids? And and then like what are what are, what's kind of the cycle? And I'm gonna throw a link to that video so people can check out a little bit more of a visual in the top if you uh, for after the show if you are in the audience. Below. Yes, we're learning a lot about this amazing uh, uh, predatory mite. 
um, <clears throat> the thing is, is they, they, uh, we learned this week, and I knew already, is one, uh, just one uh, customer uh, bought some, and it didn't work out. And then I, I inquired what, so he was, uh, they were burning sulfur every night. So <laughs> they don't like sulfur at all. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so so it killed them. Uh, and they said, oh, if it just doesn't work also in our facility, then yeah, for sure you burn it. They receive a, a sulfur shower every night. Uh, for sure it kills them. So it, it is um, amazing. The, the, in fact, it, 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 its life cycle is about six weeks. So uh, it will, uh, the first um, part of its life, it starts as a, an egg mass. And then uh, it will um, transform itself, uh, then the larva hatch from the egg mass. The, that stage lasts about, uh, I would say, eight to nine days. Then they form their first chrysalid. That lasts about three to four days. Then it's the protonymph. Um, then it starts, um, it, it's already predatory at, that, at every stage. Um, it just gets uh, more and more hungry. Live. It's like, uh, oh, I see the live thing. It gets thing, larger. But... And then it, it builds a second chrysalis again, and then it becomes a deuter nymph, and then it builds another chrysalis again, then it becomes a triton nymph, and then it builds a chrysalis again, and then it becomes the adult. So the the from the egg to the adult, it lasts about three weeks, and then the adults uh, will live about fourteen to twenty one days, and during that uh, that time, it will lay its own eggs, about forty five to one hundred fifty eggs. Um, all the they're all females um so uh, and they they um, the number of prey they eat will depend on the size of the prey uh the the only known predator that we know uh to them yet is spider um what we've known yet they eat uh they prefer tri uh, trips is their preferred meal uh they eat all stages uh aphids uh, spider mites, European red mites, uh, they control even mealybugs, um, echinotrips, uh, psyllids, uh, even white flies, and they go even after the adult white flies. Uh, this you can check on my LinkedIn page, Claude Robert, on, on that's from my Nets Protection. I have a video from uh, uh, Vineland Research Station, which are the ones that uh, rediscovered that predator, in fact. So, um, it's really amazing. We're testing them right now against cyclone and mite, and uh, also against scale. Um, so uh, this, I don't know any test results about them yet. We know they'll be uh, usable outside. Um, we were still trying to figure out the introduction rates. Um, they're counting on me for cannabis. Uh, the, pr the producers, uh, the ones are producing uh, uh, applied um, biomix in BC. So they're counting on me to get uh, more data uh, for cannabis. Uh, at Niagara College uh, in Ontario, um, they have, a, they have a, a part of the college that's for cannabis uh, technicians. Um, they they, they um, noted that they, they, you can, uh, they reproduce in cannabis. So uh, they won't reproduce on the plant. I mean, they won't lay their eggs on the plant. They will lay their eggs on the, in the substrate. Uh, they, they want moist conditions. They're not too finicky like other predatory mites uh, for relative humidity. Uh, they prefer, their preferred is 24 Celsius. I would like to convert in Fahrenheit. And 60% uh, relative humidity is their ideal uh, conditions. But um, that, uh, that is uh, uh, what... The, so we figured out it was a thousand individual per acre of uh, peppers uh, to start as a preventive. Uh, if you need, uh, if you have a, an infestation, then you'll need more. Um, but we're still trying to figure out uh, the, the right exact rates of, a, of a introduction for the different crops that we... Uh, and the beauty of them also is that they're able to walk across trichomes. So they won't stick in the buds like other predators could do, like uh, Aureus uh, will get stuck in the buds. Um, that's uh, Aureus is a trip predator that is used often. Um, so other predators could get stuck in the flowers and you don't want to be smoking any bugs. So, uh, but Nathan is able to walk across spider mite webs, waxy surfaces, 
uh, glandular trichomes of of cannabis. Uh, there's no problem for him. He's so large that he just walks across them and doesn't get stuck in even in the stickiest buds. So that's another really good advantage of this bug. They're freaking hilarious and they're nuts. They're absolutely like you can actually capture it with a like a lens or anything. They're 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 very big and very fun to have around. And I've got hundreds of thousands of questions as always for my expert each and every week. But unfortunately, we only have an hour and a half, so you'll have to be back next time for more questions, comments, or concerns. I don't predict a lot of concerns, although you know I'm a lively motherfucker. I'll say that. Um, but anyways, I wanted to thank you all again, and I appreciate you all for being here. Claude, Matthew, it's always great. All the dankest dank hour people that are always here for a visit. So again, so before we go, we got to do the most important things is, is give our special guests the opportunity to let people know where to catch them. So Matthew, we'll let you go first, and then Claude, you'll be our closer for the day. Matthew, where can people get a hold of you and find info on your for professional inquiries, you can find me at zenthanol.com and contact me there. You can also find my free educational information on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, where I go over things with my pest primer series, especially, which is very chock full of information about pest life cycle, physiology, uh, what makes them so uh, good at what they do, and also their vulnerabilities. I also go over things like biocontrols and also various plant health topics. I just made a video a couple of months ago at this point about hop latent and viroid and viroids in general. So people are very curious about that. And I cite a bunch of literature related to that for people who are curious and want an intro to viroids. You can also find me on my Instagram at syncangel. That's S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L, like synchronize. Thank you, Matthew. Claude, where can we find you about what's going on? And again, appreciate you being here. It's another amazing episode, and we will catch you back soon. But before we do, play us out with your beautiful self there, Claude. Where can we find you? Yes, so uh, I'm uh, in Canada, uh, but you can reach me across uh, the world uh, to ask me any question. Uh, I'm a passionate, so uh, I like to answer uh, people's... Uh, I like new questions, I like challenges and everything like that. So people uh, can find my find me professionally, but they can write me an email at crobert at anetsisbioprotection.com. That's all in one word. Um, so they can check our new website. It's going to come online soon. Uh, we're all, all over the social media. Uh, we're, we have an Instagram page. We have our, our Twitter thing, and we are on Facebook too. Uh, we are also, um, the people can also reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, Claude Rabat from Anatis Bioprotection. I have some cool videos sometimes uh, that I put up as posts there. And uh, I also have an Instagram at Claude underscore the underscore Druid. Uh, but I don't, I'm not really active, but you can reach me there. I, I check my messages, meaning I don't post often. It's been years, I think. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad to have been part of that. Uh, another amazing hour and a half. I'd like to thank everybody too. Um, and I just can't wait for the next uh, show. Awesome. Looking forward to it again. And I appreciate it. I'm going to close down the room. Make sure to check out all of the cool stuff and the things. We appreciate you all. And then. Boom. Hello. Let's. Oh, yeah. There we go. Stop the screen share. Let's do the thing. Hello, everybody, as my long hair, my beautiful long hair. So we have, it's, no, it's not beautiful. It's a mess. But anyways, can you hear me? Probably not, because that's how things usually roll. Uh, it does appear that you can hear me. So uh, if I'm coming through loud and clear, I appreciate each and every one of you for showing up today. Um, I, 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 we have a lot of fun stuff coming on down lane. Thank you, Matthew Gates and Cloud for coming in today. It was awesome. I look forward to sharing space with all of you again. If you haven't already, check out all of the links in the description. Check out uh, the daga.academy website where you can share, um, grow along with the growers and see what else is going on. Um, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up over the next few days. We have uh, uh, Mark, Brian and Marco tomorrow. Let's open up that calendar 
and check out what's going on there because I also think there's another show going on right now um, that we can send you all over to to enjoy, which is still happening. Uh, thanks, everybody, again for coming on to go. And there is Joe to Herb on Thursday. We are back next week with uh, Cannabis for Breakfast and hopefully Breeders Roundtable. Again, appreciate each and every one of you and keep it growing.